Welcome to episode 342 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing actor, writer, and director Oliver Robbins to talk about his new low-budget horror film, Celebrity Crush. Oliver was a child actor who played the young boy in Poltergeist. He grew up, went to USC film school, and has continued to make films. He actually directed a film I wrote in 2008 called Man Overboard. You can actually see the poster behind me after that one. Um, and that's actually how I got to know Oliver. We shared the same manager at the time, um, and we've become friends since. I was able to talk Oliver into starring in my recent film, The Rideshare Killer, so keep an eye out for him there as well. He does a great job, um, has a number of very memorable scenes in my film. But today he's going to talk about his new film, Celebrity Crush, and how he put that together. Oliver is also a produced writer um, and talks about one of his spec sales to the Hallmark Channel and how that all came together. Oliver is very candid, offers a ton of really great practical advice on screenwriting and filmmaking. He has decades of experience in the um, industry, so keep an eye out for that or stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 342. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell a screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I am working on. I'm still plugging away on the mystery thriller feature film that we shot in December, The Rideshare Killer. I just sent in notes for the second cut of the film to my editor. So far, everything has been virtual. He's been down in Hollywood. I'm out in the um, the valley. So everything has been going pretty well, just sending notes back and forth. So hopefully we'll just have another cut. Um, hopefully the editor will have another cut for me in the next couple of weeks. And, um, and I think on the next cut, we'll probably be in person. Um, I'm not sure. We'll just see how it turns out. Um, but so far, being virtual has been um, really not really a big issue at all. It's um, definitely getting pretty pretty close, and I do anticipate um, that there will be at least a couple more passes. A lot of the stuff I've been doing is really what I consider to be the most fun part of the whole process. The second cut was pretty solid. I mean, it was basically our story. There's definitely some things that need to be changed, but we're really fine-tuning things now, um, but it's really coming to life. I was listening to a lot of dance music, trying to figure out what song to place at the beginning. Um, you know, it's the opening scene is a dance club scene, so we have some dance music. You know, it has to sort of set the tone. Um, part of the the shtick of this film is that it's an homage to the great Giallo films of the 60s and 70s. So I was watching some of those films um, for their title sequence, trying to figure out how those title sequences worked. You know, I've been watching modern films, looking at their title sequence and kind of just figuring out how my own title sequence is going to work. Um, and this is down literally to the font of the opening credits. I was going through fonts, trying to find one that I like. Um, and that sort of was reminiscent of these Giallo films. Um, it's putting a lot of the finishing touches on the film. Um, and again, I find this part sort of very fun. It's it's um, it's sort of the icing on the cake. Um, anyways, we still got a ways to go, but it is definitely moving ahead slowly. I've also been working on my film noir script. I probably wrote this script over 20 years ago. I did a major overhaul on it probably about five years ago. Um, so this this white polish is, or this polish is pretty light. Um, it shouldn't take me more than a week. Hopefully as the editor's working on, on the script, I'll be able to polish up the script and have it done here in a week. And, and I'm hoping Hoping he'll have the um, the next cut back in about a week, so hopefully that will work out pretty well. But um, but this is the project I'm trying to shoot next. I think it will be a good complement to the Rideshare Killer. It's similar in tone. It's a mystery um, thriller. Um, so you know, there's a lot of things I've done on the Rideshare Killer that I can kind of build on. Um, but I've been spending time, you know, doing that rewrite and um, still trying to raise money as well. We have a ways to go just on the um, the financing front to get all of that in place. Anyway, that's the main thing I'm working on um, this week. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I am interviewing actor, writer, and director Oliver Robbins. Here is the interview. 
Welcome, Oliver, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, actually. So um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you will notice the poster behind me. Um, that was actually a project that we worked on. I was a writer. You were the director of that um, over now 10 years ago, if you can believe it. Um, but let's talk about your early career, um, just a little bit maybe about Poltergeist, kind of how you got into the business, and then we'll talk um, up to your um, recent film, Celebrity Crush. But maybe just to start out, where did you grow up and how did you break into the business? Well, I grew up in New York City, actually, and I lived there mm -hmm. until I was seven years old. And, you know, like all people moving to Los Angeles, we always tried our hand at acting especially at that time in the 1970s i i told my parents i want to be an actor and they're like no yesterday you wanted to be a fireman the other day you wanted to be a policeman so they put me in a commercial workshop class and at the end of the class it was run by this great casting agent named sheila manning and she said you know oliver's really good he should maybe do commercials so she introduced me to a couple agents of the day it was agency called herb tannen which was like the premier children's agency of the day um, and she sent me on auditions and my very first commercial I got was this fertilizer commercial. And it was funny because the guy who acted with in it with me, who played my father, wrote the movie Stand By Me, uh, Ray Gidding. I also wrote Starman. It's just a small world. Yeah. And yeah. then I did, I went from a fertilizer commercial to Poltergeist, believe it or not. And what was that experience like? How did you get that audition? The same thing. You were just going out and did you audition for a number of big films like that, but you didn't get them? Like it just was the right place, right time. How did that all come together? It was it was actually really random how it all happened. Um, there was something called an open call at the time where basically what that is, is that anyone and her mother, you could you know show up and audition. You didn't need an agent. You didn't need anyone. So it was outside MGM Studios, which is now Sony. And hundreds of kids were standing in line, hundreds. And my mom said to me, so do you really, do you really want to stand in line here? Uh, do you want to do this? And I'm like, sure, I have nothing else to do. And I'm just thinking, what would have happened if I said, nah, no, let's just go to the park and play baseball instead. I never would have been a poltergeist. So I stood in line and uh, we met with the casting person. I don't know how they did it. Mike Fenton, who's casted all of Mr. Spielberg's movie of the day, like Goonies and everything else. And he actually went and he asked us questions and we didn't know anything about what Poltergeist was about. They, he asked, he said, what are you scared of, Oliver? And I said, well, I'm scared of this clown doll I have. I'm scared of this tree outside. I basically described Robbie Freeling. I, I described all his focus. Um, so that's that's and they said, oh, my God, he is the character because they're looking for a kid who could be natural. You know, let's face it, you know, at nine, 10 years old, you're not going to be a master thespian that wants him to be very natural on camera. So they, they saw that I was physically manifesting all the things that Robbie sh should have. And then they want to see if I could read lines and just see if I could be natural. Could I make it my own, as they say? So they gave me the lines and I did well with that, but I couldn't scream at all. I mean, that was the thing. Like, I just, nothing came out. They're like, and Toby took me aside one during the audition process. He said, you know, the secret to a great horror movie, Oliver, is the scream. And he knew that, you know, from Texas Chainsaw. I didn't, I hadn't seen it at the time, obviously, at that age. So I met with a coach who taught me how to scream. I mean, there was actually someone, I specialized in screaming for kids. So, and who would, who would believe that? But in Hollywood, they have someone who can teach you how to scream. So I actually learned how to belt out a scream. Huh. And, and you can say, as we know from Poltergeist, screaming was really important for that movie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that's a great story. Let's talk about some of your writing. Um, you sold a script to Hallmark years ago called You've Got a Friend starring John Schneider. Maybe you can talk about that sale a little bit. Um, how did that sale come about? Well, this is the thing. And honestly, Hallmark movies are made for very little money. They do so much with so little. And because of that, they really don't pay you that much for the script. So I called up, I wrote the script about this little boy who built a soapbox racer and is befriended by the town crazy, who was later played by John Schneider. And I thought this would be the greatest family movie ever. And I thought of making it my own, directing it, you know, doing it as a feature. And I thought, you know what, this would be, it's a little dark, but this would be the perfect Hallmark movie. So I called up every major agency. I called up William Morris. I called a creative artist. And honestly, every agent I spoke to was not interested at all. And the, the honest truth is um, they really don't pay enough for the percent that an agent's going to get. So there was zero interest. Mm -hmm. And they and they liked the script. They thought it was a good script, but they just really couldn't spend their time, which is understandable because their fee would be so small. Yeah. So I said, you know and what? Just let me back you up. Let me back you up really one second. So you're pitching to these agencies. Are these people that you had relationships? At this point, you had been to USC film school. You had obviously been in the business. So did you have relationships to, to call all these people you're calling and pitching it to? Were the people you knew? Were you cold calling? And maybe talk about that process a little I bit. I was pretty much cold calling. 
Um, and I was just saying, hey, this is Oliver Robbins, and I was in Poltergeist, and they could care less because honestly, <laughs> they could. I mean, they don't care that you're an act child actor at all, even though I was in a big movie. Were you a writer? What have you written? So they didn't care at all. But I convinced them, you know, to read the script, and they're like, and they read the script. So the writing is solid. They really like it, but. We can't, this is not, obviously, it's a little soft for a studio movie. Uh, they're not making films like this. And I said, what about, like, you know, Hallmark Channel? Like, oh, uh, they really weren't on the radar at Hallmark, you know, because they wanted to pitch, they wanted to sell big movies to Warner Brothers. And, you know, and, and that makes sense because you're going to get, by the time they're done with their fee and sharing with the agency, it would be a very small fee. So I think you're in a situation, I was in a situation where I knew it was perfect for Hallmark. So I call up Hallmark, you know, directly. And I get the executive on the phone, Liz Yost, and she is like so kind and amazing. And she actually takes my call. And I'm like thinking, I'm talking to like a head of development. Now she's vice president there. And I tell her my story and she says, that really sounds perfect for us. And I'm like, really? So yeah, send us the script. So I, I sent her the script, they read the script and they said, Rue, really like this story. We wanna make your movie. I'm like, really? So there really wasn't anything, it was no, there were no contacts or special connections. Mm -hmm. They were just so kind. Every, Fallmark, what I've learned, is run like as a big family operation, and they know exactly what they want. They know their audience extremely well, and they're extremely honest, and they don't make you jump through like a million hoops, which, you know, a lot of studios, you can end up in some development hell, and you're well, there forever, you know, going through the pitching process. It's not like that there. They, they know what they want, and they're going to buy it if they want it. So that's exactly what they did. They bought the script. And they said, we're going to make this. And it, it was a very fast process. And it mm -hmm. was great to just see it come to the screen. And it was the, it was the highest June premiere for them, too. So obviously, they knew their audience very well. Yeah. Did you get the sense that that's how they, they got material? Or that was sort of a, or a unique situation? I, you know, I had no idea. I'm assuming they go through agents in different, the, the proper channels usually, too. But at the same time, I think they're also open to seeing what comes from you know, filmmakers. And they also knew I went to USC film school. So I wasn't just like, you know, um, some random guy from Milwaukee, not to say you can't write a great script if you're from Milwaukee, but I, I was trained and they knew that. And when you come out of USC, you know, you might not be the, you not might be Scott Martin Scorsese, but you, you know, the basics of how to tell a story and you've taken the basic classes. So they knew that going in. Um, and I explained that to them too. Um, so, and they read it and obviously you could have a great script, but it has to be really right for them. It has to hit all the points for their audience because they know their audience so well. Yeah. Yeah. And what are some of those points? Number one, what are some of those specific points that you have to hit? But number two, how did you know what these points were? Do you watch a lot of these Hallmark movies? You know, this is what's funny is I didn't know that I wrote a Hallmark Channel movie. I didn't design it. Like I didn't go into writing. You've got a friend say, Hey, I'm going to write a Hallmark Channel movie. I wrote a movie from my heart that really meant mm -hmm. something to me. And it just turned out to be something that was so perfect for them. And, you know, and I don't even know exactly what the points were, because I think that's always really changing. I think it just appealed to their audience. And, and you know, honestly, You've Got a Friend is actually a little bit darker, I think, than most Hallmark Channel movies, because you have this little boy who lost his entire family, who's an orphan, who his parents don't even want, you know, his family doesn't even want him, that, that he goes to live with. The person that befriends him is a freak in the town, is the town crazy and he befriends this little boy so from the get-go it's actually a, if you really analyze you got a friend it's actually an extremely dark movie you have two lost souls that come together that really kind of help each other and i was really inspired by like if anything uh not hallmark channel cinema paradiso that was the movie that was my, i kind of was my my model if you could say it was my inspiration about two people or hero you know, needs the he needs a kid, and the kid needs the hero. And yeah. and at the end of the day, they're both heroes in their own way, and um, that worked for the Hallmark audience, obviously. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. So let's get into um, your most recent film, Celebrity Crush. Um, maybe to start out, you can um, just give us a quick picture log on what is that film all about. Well, this I'll give you the inspiration for it too. I, you know, as a child actor, and I grew up to become who I am today, and I do to, go to a lot of horror conventions talking about Poltergeist. And I thought, you know, what if I got seduced by a crazy fan, a beautiful, crazy fan who just, you know, made me feel good about myself, that made me, that took me in. And then, you know, I made the biggest mistake of sleeping with her. And then I'm trapped in her dungeon. So that mm -hmm. was kind of the inspiration behind Celebrity Crush. So it's about this sociopathic fan named Emily. And she's obsessed with this film called Chain Face Clown that came out in the 80s. And, you know, the film was like kind of a B movie. It wasn't 
it wasn't an 80s kind of film. I mean, I mean, it wasn't like a poltergeist 80s kind of film. Yeah, yeah. So she ends up, you know, turn, she turns out to be the super fan when, in fact, she pretends to not even care about the movie. And, you know, my character that is, is someone's a little insecure about himself. He's kind of lost. He has, you know, a beautiful fiance he cares about. But for the first time, she likes him for him. Doesn't even care, but doesn't even know supposedly that he was in this movie. And for him, that's the greatest thing ever. So he gets totally, completely seduced. And in her mind, she's going to spend her entire life with him. You know, they're going to be together. They're going to have a family. They're going to make Chain Face Con Part Do. You know, and when that really doesn't work out, she has to go to Plan B, trap me, you know, makeshift dungeon with the hope that you know I'll fall in love with her. And of course, yeah. that's how you know all healthy relationships start, and you know, go on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And, and, and it's kind of a, a blackish, darkish comedy in many ways where I'm horrified and everything she's doing is so awful and terrible. But in her mind, it's the most wonderful thing. Her dream is finally coming true. She gets to be with the real life Jonathan Blakely. Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid comparisons like a misery? Um, you know, and there's other films that sort of have the same setup where someone kidnaps the other person and, you know, tries to get something from them. In this case, it's love, but it's a kind of a setup, but certainly misery is a very similar setup. How do you differentiate yourself from those? Oh, I didn't. I copied misery scene for scene. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> probably, yeah, it's probably a pretty good movie then. <laughs> I admit it. I copied it. No, it's, it's a very, it's just an entirely different movie. I've always wanted to make a black comedy. And this is kind of comedic and very dark in a lot of ways. And you don't know whether you should laugh or scream. Misery plays it very, very straight. And, you know, let's face it, that setup is, is very generic. It's what you do with it once you're into the story, too. So I wanted my audience to, you know, not know whether they should laugh or scream. And, you know, the things are so crazy and over the top. And you're thinking, this is really funny, but should I be laughing because it's so horrific? You know, so that's kind of the tone I was going for. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's dig into your writing process a little bit. Um, where do you typically write? Are you the guy that has his home office? You write there, or do you go to Starbucks? Do you write in the morning? Do you write at night? What does your sort of writing schedule look like? Um, I'm really a morning person, and I like to write at home. I know a lot of people go to Starbucks, and I like the energy. I need to be focused. I need to be in a really quiet place where I can just think. And you know, something doesn't come to me. What I've realized is that you shouldn't struggle. You shouldn't like sweat blood, as they say, trying to figure it out. I go outside and I walk around. I might even take a couple of days off, work on something totally different. And then, you know, lo and behold, a new idea comes to you. And then you write that down. And then you work on that. And then it kind of, you manipulate that concept and you have various layers. And you might write 20 pages of something and realize this is just not working. This this is not plain. There's nothing going on here that that's compelling to me or most likely not to the audience. So sometimes I just throw it out, you know, and start over. Mm -hmm. um, but most of my ideas just are something that you really can't you really can't put a finger on. Like I'm going to come up with a great idea today. I'm going to fix this first act problem. You really were never, that that never happens for me too. Mm -hmm. It's always a struggle. And then you have this moment of like clarity. It's like a you know where something just comes to you and you realize why didn't I think of that before? And it's so simple and it's always something that's so elegant that just totally completely works. And then hopefully that is something when you write it down and it comes to fruition, um, that actually plays. And sometimes it really doesn't. And sometimes you have to make the movie to discover it doesn't really work or shoot that scene. Mm -hmm. And you thought in your head, this is the greatest scene. It's so funny or it's so scary. And it, it might not work at all. And it might end up in your movie. And then you actually have to end up cutting it out, which you learn, later learn at a test screening months later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. How, how much time do you spend outlining and just sort of getting the idea ready versus in final draft cranking out, you know, scene description and dialogue? I, it really it really differs between projects, but I really like to just outline the entire story. And what I do, I do old-fashioned way. I get out little note cards. I learned this at USC, and I put them up on the board, and I move all the scenes around. Um, and I think, you know, and then I figure out my structure based on that. Um, and then I go back to those cards, and then I create a more detailed outline. I'm saying, where's the character this Bowman? What are all the beats? Are the beats really working? How long is my first act? And, you know, something we really discovered in Celebrity Crush in the first cut, I discovered audiences, you know, are not as patient as they were maybe 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I wanted to have a slow burn. And um, it really in this for this particular film, our first cut of the movie, it didn't work at all. And I really tightened it up. It's sort of like like with Back to the Future. I don't know if Back to the Future would play today. And people say how brilliant it is. But if you released it, 
I can almost, I have a feeling that the, that the story might have moved along a lot faster today if they shot it. He, Mike Marty doesn't go back in time until almost 35 minutes into the film. Today, it'd probably be like 10, 15 minutes because people, like it or not, really have short attention spans for stories. You know, like mm -hmm. Butch Cassidy's Sundance Kid, they spent a long time getting to know these characters. I don't think you can make a studio movie like that today, even though those are my favorite kinds of movies because people are used to clicking. They're used to that, you know, the TikTok, you know, moments, you know, things have to move along very rapidly. So that's something I, you know, what I really learned in Celebrity Crush is that you got to get into the story faster. Um, not to say you can't have a movie where you get to know people and really get to know the characters and the relationships. But for this genre and this piece, it didn't really play. So we really, that's what we really struggled with, with Celebrity Crush. Hmm, yeah, you know, you, it's funny you mentioned Back to the Future. I have a 10-year-old and 7-year-old daughters, and I can often tell, you know, I'll show them some of these classic movies that I loved as a kid. Obviously, Back to the Future I thought was a great movie as a kid. Um, but they were able to sit through it, um, and some movies they're not. Like, for instance, they were all crazy about Jaws at one point. And, you know, but Jaws has this whole thing. It has the opening scene, but then it goes into this long, you know, the the mayor and the bureaucracy and the politics, and it just completely loses, lose my kids. But Back the future seem to hold their attention a little That's bit. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, the other one that I mentioned, I mentioned this on the air as well in other podcasts, is The Shining. I showed that to my kids. Um, I know it's probably not pro appropriate for a nine, nine or a seven okay. to nine year old, but but and because okay. to be honest with you, I thought because you mentioned Slow Burn, I thought that that would be a film that they would watch for five minutes and just get completely bored with. Because The Shining is the the slow burn, like it's the you know the quintessential slow burn. But if you, it absolutely was. My kids were riveted to that movie, absolutely riveted. You couldn't pry them apart, pry them, pry them from it and if you watch it it is a slow burn but every single scene is laced with tension and drama and you know just stuff context um that keeps i think everybody interested yeah and the performances are so strong it's yeah so, yeah, super, yeah, such yeah. And so interesting yeah. too and watching nicholson perform he could read the yellow pages and yeah. you'd be like this is amazing yeah yeah so anyway so okay well so um how long does it typically take you to write a script? And we can use this as an example. So you spend a bunch of time outlining, a bunch of time in Final Draft. What is your typical time frame for getting a script finished? I can write a draft in maybe two and a half, three weeks, you know, rapidly. I've written scripts as fast in a weekend, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they, it's, but the, given that, you're going to go back and rewrite everything. And it usually takes me probably like four or five drafts before I've nailed something down to the point where I feel like this is ready to show my friends to get notes. Um, and getting notes from your friend, your fellow, someone you really trust it is so important because it's in your head and you're seeing something which might not be communicating to your audience, you know, when they finally read the script. And then I say, mm -hmm. well, I didn't understand this thing about the character or this was really slow for me. And why did the character do this? Um, and if you don't do that, you might have that issue when you're actually making a movie, which I've also run into where I've, I've ignored my friends and ignored my notes and I just went in and shot things and, you know, and I later have to fix it, you know, in post-production. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the development process. So you've written the script, you have a draft, you're happy about it. who are these friends that you send to? Are they other writers, actors? Um, and, and what do you do with those notes? How do you sort of interpret these notes? How many people, who are they and how do you interpret the notes? Well, I give it to my people from you uh, that are trained that are can look at it, assess it. Because a lot, if you've never read a screenplay before, it'd be really difficult to really understand uh, what you're looking at because the format. So you have to get. I think you have to give it to people who have read scripts or possibly even written them themselves. Um, and then once they give my notes, but they get the notes back, they might not. You know, they might they might be speaking a language which I might not even understand myself. Like they might say something that implies that I should change something, but they're missing something that I really intended. So you have to almost and many times, not all the time, but you have to sometimes read the tea leaves like this isn't working for them for X, Y, Z reason. But it's really another reason why it's not working or, you know, and you really have to interpret that. And you want your friends who read your script to be extremely honest with you. If something just got awful. You need to know that right now and you need to possibly rewrite that scene or maybe the script isn't playing at all um, or you change tone. And, you know, that was the thing we really struggled with with even Celebrity Crush. I wanted to take the tropes of a horror movie and kind of spin it around and, and, and infuse black comedy into it. So I wanted some horrific, but I also wanted something kind of funny at the same time. And that's really hard to really convey on the page, too, because a lot of that was going to happen later on the screen in terms of my direction and how I was going to direct the actors. Um, so sometimes I, you know, they might, I might get a note from a, a fellow writer and I'll be like, no, 
that actually will work later on because I'm going to direct actor because I, I really do have a definitive vision in my head of how I want to shoot that scene, how it's going to play, and now the performance, which might not, you know, for better or worse, might not be on the page at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, with a film like this, you mentioned um, sort of merging dark comedy with horror. How do you approach screenplay structure and even genre sort of structure? Are there some tropes, um, some movies you watch, some tropes that you got in there, and then you at some point want to subvert those tropes? Maybe just talk about sort of some of those, the structure, the genre, sort of the things that you're bringing to this. I'm really big on the three-act structure. I learned that at USC, and it really works well. And, you know, once you have your three-act structure or your beats, then you can say, hey, okay, let's move scenes around. We can do flashbacks. What do we want to reveal about the character? What is important for the audience to know about the main character at this point or any of the characters? So I kind of play with that, you know. Do I need to get to – what does the audience need to know to feel smart at certain scenes? Or I don't want them to feel smart. Do I want to have that reveal later on? Um and, you know, that's kind of how I come about, you know, my structure. You know, I like to have a big, you know, act one break. You have your setup and then you have your midpoint, you know, obviously. And then I, you know, I build to the third act. And then you know, at the same time, I'm trying to build and, and at the same time um, combine all the various story threads that are going on with all each of the characters. And then I just, you know, you build your climax. And, you know, if you only look at all movies I and mean, comedies alone, all films, you know, follow that structure pattern too. Uh, at least Hollywood movies do. Now, you know, not to say there's, you know, films that don't. And you know, um, and I love a movie like Citizen Kane. You know, they always talked about it in film school. And you know, at first when I saw that film, I was I bored out of my mind. But then I really studied that movie, and it is just genius of what you're going back and forth in time. And it really still has a three act structure because you're getting those those same beats are happening, only that it's a non linear story that you're getting. I maybe I'm not as advanced enough a filmmaker to no, be able to no, yeah. Kind of, yeah, no, I, I yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. I mean, people I think overcomplicate this idea of three act structure really is just beginning, middle and end. I mean it's just it's not anything overly it's just the natural organic part of telling a story. It has to have a beginning, middle or an end, or I don't know that it's even really a story. And yeah, and is that you know, and then you have you know, and traditionally you want your characters to arc and where do they go in the story? You don't have to like them, but they have to you have to understand them. And then you look at a movie like Ghostbusters, for instance. You know, you you know, you weren't at USC, the character has to arc and has he changed from the first act to the third act? Well those characters don't change at all. They they and even like a movie like Blues Brothers, but it's kind of so there are a lot of films, you know, that do break the rules of traditional like kind of filmmaking because how does in Ghostbusters how do they possibly change? I mean, they they really don't well, change. The Bill the Murray character and I'm now you, I, my memory is a little vague. The Bill Murray character doesn't change because doesn't he sort of have the love interest and sort of? No, he he's exactly the same guy huh. in treating all the situation. I think you know up until the very end of the movie, you know. Yeah. Um, if anything, he's learned to maybe give of himself a little more to Scurney Weaver's character. He, you see how much he cares about her, but he seems kind of aloof, you know, from the from the first moment you meet him at the university to that last mo last moment when they've you know they've killed the ghosts and they're walking out in, in Manhattan, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what um, what kind of advice do you have for people that are trying to break into film? Um, do you have some write a spec, go shoot a short? What is your advice if someone comes to you and they want to be a writer? I, I would avoid going to the film industry completely. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, in that vein, though, I, I really believe that you have to love it so much because it is such a difficult business. And it doesn't matter. You know, I heard the story about the guy who, you know, Earn Winkler directed um, – um, was it not Earl and Kirk? God, oh shit! I forgot. They all directed Empire Strikes Back, and everyone's like, everyone's gonna say, Kaz Dan, yeah, yeah." No, he's no, the writer. No, he wrote Empire. Yeah. He wrote Empire, okay. but yeah, the I, director. Anyways, yeah. my I'm having like a senile moment. Yeah. But he, you know, he called up creative artists. You know, with a movie, he said, and this is a story I heard at the Star Wars convention. He called up. He said, "Hey, I, I'm the guy who directed Empire Strikes Back," and the aging assistant like blew him off. That's what he said. They had like zero interest. <laughs> And this is a guy who directed Empire Strikes Back. So that just gives you an idea of how difficult the film industry is. They don't care. Every time you're trying to reinvent yourself and reprove yourself. Um, I heard that, too, about, you know, James Cameron. He directed Titanic. He wanted to do Avatar. The studio said no. So he actually had to go out and shoot, like, his own little, like, promo movie with his own camera, with hire some actors to say the 20th Century Fox this is my movie I want to make. I, and they didn't care that he directed the highest grossing film of all time. So you have to be, I think, incredibly passionate about whatever you're doing. And you really can't ever take no for an answer. Even if people tell you this is the worst possible script, I don't know why. No one wants to see this. 
you have to be a believer at the end of the day because, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe other people are right. Maybe it is garbage that you're working on, but it really doesn't matter because you're, you have to make, even if you're making the room and you know, I don't know, I don't consider, you know, you, you have to be passionate about your movie making and you know, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, you know, about your yeah. film. And you can't go into the film industry saying, I'm going to become a multimillionaire because most likely you're going to die poor. I mean, that's the physical reality of the situation um, because it is such a hard business. And not to say you can't do extremely well, but I think you just have to be passionate. And I would say write from your heart. And if you write something honestly from your heart, other people are really going to see that. You know, um, Even the Hallmark Channel movie I wrote, I wrote that because not to say I'm going to make a Hallmark Channel movie or I'm going to get a movie on TV. I wrote it because I, I it's something a subject matter I really cared about. And that really shines through. If you write from something that you care about and is meaningful, you know, audiences are going to get it. And it's strange, you know, people in Hollywood will really do appreciate really good writing. They they appreciate good scripts because there's so many bad scripts running around, you know, and those mm -hmm. sometimes even get made. That that's that's so I guess going circling back around, my advice is write from your heart, be passionate, and never take no for an answer. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Um, what have you seen recently that you thought was really great? Is anything under the radar, Netflix, Hulu, or even out in the theater? I guess not in the theaters with COVID, but anything you've seen recently we can recommend to our listeners? You know, you know what I've really gotten into? The, the show Dark. I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix. No, I haven't. But it's, it's this great – it's almost like a the picture Back to the Future, as if you took back a German version of Back to the Future but made it ex – put a Germanish expressionism in it and infused hmm. this darkness and all the characters have issues and psychological problems. I don't want to – I don't want to spoil it for anyone too. Okay. But it's all about time travel about and what goes on in this town and all the things that happen to all the different characters in this town. Um it's highly addicting, and you know, I was thinking, you know, I love foreign films, but I was thinking, you know, it's in German. I'm gonna have to watch subtitles for hours and hours. It doesn't matter. You get so into the story. So I recommend watching Dark on Netflix. And I, and actually, I'm so into it. I, I know the season premiere is uh, June 26 for season three of Dark. So. Okay. I, I'm so into it. I, I'm, I'm getting ready for uh, season three right now. Okay. Well, cool. That's a great recommendation. How can people see Celebrity Crush? What is the release schedule going to be like? It for is. You? It is out right now. So you can go to. You know, I don't think you can go to Vudu. You can go to where else can you go? Your Fandango, iTunes, uh, all everything. Everything. Gotcha. I think it's out on everything too. And I'm going to give a shout out to my you know producers. Kaiba Films, they help make it happen and they nice. use the needed funds to make the movie and tell and GB, thank you so much. So that's my shout out to my investors and okay. you know, we'll appreciate it because the movie wouldn't be out there without those guys. Yeah, for sure, for sure. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Um, you can find me on Facebook and I'm, I have like two followers, I think on Twitter, but you can add me on Twitter, Ollie Guy okay. on Twitter and hopefully I'll have more, you know, soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you, Oliver. I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Good luck with this film. And of course, um, I'll see you back when you're ready for your next film. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Ash. And thank you. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the screenplay database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. 
We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services, so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV and web series pilots, all types of projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those whenever you want once you join. The classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Gavin Rothery. Gavin was roommates with Duncan Jones when he did Moon, and Gavin ended up doing a lot of the concept art for that film, Moon. He talks a little bit about that, but he's moved along in his career and recently wrote and directed a really cool sci-fi film called Archive. So we'll dig into that film, and he really is um, very candid and very open and really explains how that film came together for him. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.